Bibles this morning to uh, Luke chapter 19. I'm ringing just a little bit up here, bro, if you can help me there just a little bit. Luke chapter 19, we're going to begin right here, and then we're going to pray and thank God for revelation to flow, Luke chapter 19. If you don't have your Bibles, uh, we'll have these verses up on the screen, different things that'll help you, and uh, got some different translations on some things for you this morning. But uh, look in Luke 19, verse 11. This is Jesus talking. He's fixing to give a parable, and he says, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. I mean, you got the picture. The disciples, people that are following Jesus closely, were expecting the kingdom to appear immediately. So Jesus said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. King James Version says, occupy till I come. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the word this morning. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're teaching us wonderful truths from your word that help us to be aware of your coming and the signs and just the season that we're living in in these last days. And so, Lord, we thank you for just directing us and equipping us, quickening us to these truths and helping us to recognize we're right here at the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Coming for your church to rapture us out. And Lord, but we're also to declare a truth and let people know that the other side of that is there's judgment coming on the world. And we're to declare those things. And we're to let people know that Jesus is coming soon. And so, Father, because we are aware of this season that we're living in, we can be confident in these truths because you're revealing these things and you're giving us so many signs and so many uh, things that are already declared in your word that we can know the season that we're in. So, Lord, we thank you for utterance this morning. Lord, just to deliver these things in a clear and uh, way that we'll understand in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Um, as we've spent the last four weeks, we have really talked about uh, the rapture. We, we've been teaching, we taught about four weeks on the rapture, and we called it fact check. And so we've been looking at some things that take place right around the rapture of the church. How do we know that we're in the season where the Lord is going to come? And so if you haven't been with us, I would encourage you to go online, go to the app, or go to our website. You can go to our YouTube page, go to Harvest Church Lubbock. If you go to YouTube, type in Harvest Church Lubbock, you'll see it come up, and you can catch up and, and go back. We, we spent about four Sundays really helping us uh, looking at how do we know? I've got some charts and things. Are not really a chart, but a timeline that the Lord uh, specifically uh, gave to me. When I say he gave to me, I was in Egypt. And actually, I, I mentioned last week, I think it was two thousand. I was actually 2011. I was in Egypt teaching on, teaching on eschatology. And uh, after one of the sessions one night, the Lord specifically, the Holy Spirit on the inside, I just heard him say, draw a timeline. Well, when I begin to do that and draw, uh, because at, uh, end times are like different pieces of the puzzle. When you talk about uh, all, there's different uh, books of the Bible, different pieces of prophecy that we put together. We'll talk about some of those things. But when the Lord told me to draw a timeline, it really helped me realize how much we are fastly approaching and are at the end of what we're going to call this series, the consummation of the ages. Now, that sounds like a big word, but that actually just means the end of all things. And I'm going to give you some scripture because most people just really aren't aware and that the, what the, the scripture has so many different things to say, as we've already covered for four weeks. And I still got stuff I haven't been able to give to you yet. I could literally teach prophecy just full-time all the time because you could just devote so much time to it because there's so much. A lot of the Bible is prophecy. We're going to look at a few scriptures about that and help you understand that. But because I'm a pastor, I just can't teach on it full-time. But we'll take from time to time. We'll talk about these different things. Or maybe look at the book of Daniel or look at Revelation. So right now, we just were focusing on really the events leading up to the rapture of the church and natural things, signs, things that are going on in the world right now, things that are taking place right now. I just heard this. This is last week. This is something brand new. The Sanhedrin just came to Benjamin Netanyahu, who's the prime minister of Israel. They just came to him, and they are requesting that they are able to blow the shofar horn on Rosh Hashanah, which is September 18th, which is, starts the Feast of Trumpets. They, they haven't done that since the last temple was demolished, so they've never blown the shofar. They're requesting that they're able to do that. That's just amazing. There's so much that's going on. I mean, news, you hear all the bad stuff, but you don't hear all the stuff that's going on in the Middle East and, and Turkey's making a big turn. And we've talked about some of these things and Hydrogen and how they're, he's blatantly 
publicly declaring that it's time for us to go down and take the Temple Mount and take it away, take back, you know, these things. And so uh, they're gathering for, for World War III, basically, right there in the Middle East. But right before that takes place, the church is going to get raptured out. And we've covered those things. We've talked about that. But um, I really want to swing our direction and talk about, give you some more information about how do we know and to make people aware that, that the Lord's about to come back. Now, when you say about to come back, I mean, we've got a, there may be a few, it could, it could, there is nothing, there's no prophecy or scripture to be fulfilled in order for Jesus to come right now and rapture the church. You understand? There's nothing that has to take place. Now, we have talked about, I believe, because the other festivals were fulfilled and Jesus fulfilled all those festivals that were spring festivals. There was three of them. Now there's four that take place in the fall. And I'm convinced, and I can be wrong, and I'll be glad to say I was wrong, but I'm convinced that when Jesus comes and raptures the church, it will take place on the Feast of Trumpets, which will be in September in the fall of the year that he does come. Now, the Bible says we don't know the day or the hour, but we can know the season. We've talked about that. You, and I believe we can come. I, I'm convinced we're going to know right up. I mean, this thing's real close because we already know things that are taking place. Again, we recognize the fact that the end is coming. Jesus is coming back. His second coming is different from his, um, the rapture. The rapture takes place. You've got Ezekiel 38 war, and then you've got a seven-year tribulation period, and then Jesus comes back, and we come back with him. That's Revelation 19. We return with Jesus. Hallelujah. And we're going to rule and reign. So we'll look at a few of these things, and we'll pull our... Uh, I'll have us still make sure she's got our 7,000-year timeline up there, and we'll look at that in just a minute. But what are we focus on here? We're talking about the consummation, and what does the scripture, what does the scriptures have to say about how do we know that we're right here at the end, and how long is this taking place, and how, how do you know these things, Pastor? When you say this timeline, well, I'm going to give you. I've been giving you information. I just hadn't been able to cover it all yet. So we're going to look at some more. Okay, now, so as we focus here on the end uh, and coming up, you know, this is this is to prepare us. When we're talking about the end and Jesus coming and the rapture of the church, this is to prepare us, but we don't get, we, but because we know he's coming or we, we think, well, we are at the end, we don't stick our head in the sand and just sit back and twiddle our thumbs. That's why Jesus said, I like the King James, occupy till I come. Do business until I come. So because we're talking about him coming doesn't mean we freak out, oh, Jesus come, you know, and, you know, run up the credit cards. Or buy you stuff on credit. You know, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. You don't have to do that. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? But we do business. We occupy. We, we get the word out. This is about, hey, making sure that our relatives, our family, our friends, people that we know, listen, you got to do some confrontation and say, look, if Jesus came right now, are you going to go to heaven? If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? A lot of people say, well, I, I would go to heaven. Well, you, well, how do you know you'd go to heaven? Well, because most people would say, most Americans say, well, I'm a good person. Well, just being a good person doesn't get you into heaven. If just being a good person will get you into heaven, why did Jesus come? Jesus came because we're all born into sin. And we needed a Savior. And nobody was perfect, but Jesus was perfect. And he took our place. He took the penalty and the punishment and the wrath of God. So now we're redeemed from the wrath to come. So Jesus said, there's no, no name under, under heaven whereby men must be saved other than the name of Jesus. So God had to send his son to be the substitute to redeem mankind because Adam sinned in the garden, the first man, Adam. But the second man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Think about Jesus. Jesus came from heaven, the son of God, came into flesh, you understand, died as a man, as the son of man. He died, but then was raised up. A first, he was raised first fruits. I mean, if you think about it, God came in man, the flesh, but then was raised up. I mean, I don't, you just can't figure it all out anyway. But, but Jesus, Jesus now, the Son of God who was the Son of God in heaven, the, you know, who, what, who didn't have flesh, now is, has that fleshly body. He, he whipped the devil as a man, was crucified, and now raised. And the Bible says he did it for us, so now we were resurrected with him. We're seated in heavenly places with him. We're actually in Christ. What he did, he did for us. Praise God. It has nothing to do with my notes. I'm just, I'm just talking about he's coming, but we don't stick our head in the sand and just, okay, well, we're, we're, we're going to freeze now, and, and let's, just, let's just sing kumbaya until Jesus comes. No, we got to get the word out. we got to let people know this thing is real. And, and so my goal is to help you realize, wow, we, we are here. Now, I don't know if I've helped you so far. But, but this, this, this should motivate you. and start, It's kind of like, you know, in football, they have what they call the two-minute drill. 
And, you know, in the two-minute drill, they don't get in the huddle. They're, they're, they, gotta get the, they got two minutes to get the ball in the end. They want to score before halftime or the end of the game. And so there's no huddles. They're doing plays that, that, that are really just working and doing things. And so that's what we do. We're, we're, we're just, it's like, it's like when you're, how many of you ran track? Anybody run track in high school, maybe junior high? Well, when you see the finish line, do you slow down? Do you kind of look at the crowd? Oh, you see the finish line up there, and you got running by the here and say, hey. No, what are you doing? You're focusing on the finish line. Man, you're, you're looking for the red tape. You want to crawl. Go ahead and smile when you crawl. Ah! Right? So, okay. Oh, now, look. Hebrews chapter 9. So, we're not just, we got to recognize that we are right here. And we'll put, we'll put the timeline up here in just a minute. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. This is where I got the title for our little series here, as long as it takes us to do where we need to go. Verse 26, middle of verse 26, it says, but now once at the consummation, Amplified says, at the close of the ages. Everybody say the consummation. You know what constipation, con- constipation. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what consummation means? The close. Wrapping this thing up. It's like, it's like how many of you, when maybe you got an eight to five job, and, and maybe, of course, a lot of people these days, it's like 4.45, what do they start doing? They start wrapping it up. You know, they start wrapping up, you know, instead of, instead of at 5, they start leaving before 5. Basically, they start wrapping it up, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I better say I'm meddling now. Well, excellence will go to 5 and then start wrapping it up. Anyway, because you work, and you're, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Anyway, so now at the consummation, watch this, and close of the ages, he has been manifested. He's talking about Jesus. He has been manifest or appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So now let's just make sure you got this. If Jesus came and he was the consummation of the ages, he's wrapping up things at the end. If he's closing this thing out, that started when Jesus came. So so it's kind of like at 4.45, if you start wrapping up your job, at, at 4.45, Jesus started, he started wrapping up this thing. That's how close we are right here, all right? So verse 27 says, and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. You know, judgment comes after death. Anyway, that's enough. Well, maybe we'll get to that later. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. That's what you do while you're waiting. You eagerly await him. John called it, this hope purifies. He that hath this hope, this hope has to do with waiting, and we're, we're looking for his coming. We're keeping our, we got one eye on him, one eye on eternity, and one eye on what's going on here. You got to have double vision. You got to, you got to be looking this way and looking that way. You know what I'm saying? And so we're eagerly awaiting him, and so he says he's going to appear a second time. for What does that mean for salvation? He's coming for his bride to take us. Salvation includes the fact that he purchased us, and now he's going to take the church out, which is redeeming us from the wrath to come. Paul talks about that. We've covered that really good in detail that Paul said in 1 Thessalonians that we are redeemed from the wrath to come. So that means salvation includes being redeemed from the wrath because Jesus already took all the wrath. He took the penalty. He took the punishment. So because you're saved, you don't, have to get, you don't have to drag through the tribulation period. All right? You got me so far? The New Living Translation says he has appeared at the end of the age. I like that. That's pretty self-explanatory. So when Jesus came, you could say that started the last days. We'll look at this one later. But Hebrews chapter 1 actually says that God has spoken to us through his son in these last days. So Jesus, you could say, started the last days. When Jesus was manifest and began to walk in his earthly ministry, he started the last day. Well, if, if he started the last days, we're in the last of the last days. And the timeline helps us realize when you understand how long is this church age, and, I'm t- and I've been telling you it's 2,000 years, and I'm going to give you a little more instruction on that, so a little more help on that so you can help other people with that. But let me just help you with something. When it comes to eschatology, is actually the study of end times. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe, you know, there's a prophecy conference or, or different. Well, eschatology is the study of end times, and it focuses on one of the big focuses is not just, oh, the, the apocalypse or the apocalyptic horses. You know, we talked about those, those horses, you know, the, the white horse and the, and, the, and the pale horse and the black horse and, and those different things that begin to be released when the seals are opened in Revelation chapter 6. But anyway... Uh, 
So, but eschatology really has to do with also living in the end. How do we conduct our life? What do we do right here at the end? And so we're going to be looking at some of these things. It includes the rapture. It includes the tribulation. It also includes the millennial reign. Did you know the millennial reign, millennial means 1,000 years. Did you know Jesus is going to rule on this earth for 1,000 years? We're going to rule and reign with him. He's going to do it from Jerusalem. That's why the enemy wants to, and the Antichrist will want to tear up and wipe out Israel and Jerusalem. Jesus is going to rule from Jerusalem, and we are going to rule and reign with him on this earth. For, and you say, well, how does that happen? Because the enemy, the devil, is also bound for 1,000 years. That happens when Jesus comes back. We come back with him. He's going to bind the angel. He's going to come, wrap up the devil in chains and throw him in the pit for a 1,000 years. And then he's loose for a season. Doesn't tell us how long that season is, but he's loose, and he'll go out to deceive the world to try to gather up a bunch of knuckleheads to come against God again, and then, Jason, and then God's just going to smoke them, you know, post toasties, you know, and then, and, then there's, and then there's a new heavens and a new earth. Everybody say new heavens and new earth. We've covered some of those things. So in the new heavens and the new earth, the Bible says that's where righteousness dwells. In the new heavens and the new earth. That's what Abraham was looking for. Remember, the father of faith, he said he was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. So your faith is not just to get you through life's challenges and struggles and to walk by faith. Now, you've got to get your eyes focused all the way on the end. Woo, I'm going to be in the new heaven and the new earth, and I'm going to be ruling and reigning for eternity with him. All right? So that's what this subject is all about, and this revelation should produce a fire and a zeal in us to do what we're supposed to do. Good prophecy, end time teaching, eschatology, what we're talking about, it is not, it should never produce fear. If it produces fear, it's not Bible, because the Bible, the prophecy is in itself for edification, exhortation, and comfort. All right, so good in time teaching is going to edify you, and it bears witness. You don't, there's nothing that bears witness that, oh, I'm going to have to, we're going to have to get some beanie weenies and get out the guns and, and defend ourselves through the tribulation period and fight off the Antichrist and, and, and not take the mark of the beat. No, no, that has nothing to do with the church. Paul said the church was a mystery, and so I'm going to tell you a mystery. We're not all going to sleep, but we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds, meet the Lord in the air, and we'll ever be with him. Comfort one another with these words. So that's the way we comfort. With that, that's encouraging. Woo! We're going to meet Jesus in the air, and then we're going to go to heaven with him, and then we're going to have a marriage supper of the Lamb up there, seven years. Hallelujah. Just like a Jewish, a religious, a traditional Jewish wedding, seven years, and then we're coming back. All right? So these are exciting things. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29, Paul said the time. Now, listen to Paul. This is Paul. Way back there said the time is short. Now, if you understand Paul and what Paul got this revelation, and so it's, it's what motivated Paul. Paul's revelation is what caused him to just, he was relentless in, in preaching and traveling and going and doing what God called him to do and to plant churches and to edify and do all. I mean, it's just amazing if you look at the life of Paul and what all he did, all right? Or anybody else that's just doing, that has the grace of God on their life to do what they're called to do. So again, so in these last days right now, we're recognizing these things, and, and it's like the, the two-minute drill. There's no huddle. There's, there, there's, you know, plays are changing, and there's priorities. And this is, it's not business as usual. That's what you got to understand. And you don't want to get wrapped up in the world and, and bogged down in different things and the cares of this life. Now, let me just help you. So we think prophecy or prophecy teachers is, is uh, uh, something. Uh, best way that I can explain it is the Bible, and I'm going to give you some fun stuff today. The Bible is prophecy. I mean, there's over 50 scriptures that, just, that talk about the second coming of the Lord. All right? Over 50 that talk about him coming. And there's so much... In it, and there's so much, but let me, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says that, I, and I really like this scripture because it gives you an idea of how we're to respond to the word that we look at it till something begins to take place in our heart. He says, so we have a prophetic word. Everybody say a prophetic word. A prophetic word, if any, again, anything that's prophetic or a prophecy edifies. So we have a prophetic word. Also, it has to do with uh, vision, uh, future. Sometimes we call a prophet a uh, prophet is declaring something about the future. Well, New Testament prophets are a little bit different from the Old Testament prophets. Old Testament prophets many times had different gifts that they operated in. Just like in the New Testament, there's, there's the gift of, there's the prophet's office, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Well, sometimes that prophet is going to flow a little more in discerning of spirits, gifts, you know, seeing and knowing. 
So there is an element of discernment in things that they see. And so they may declare some things. They may give a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. And, and it's a word, so it's a, it's a bit. It's like a sound bite. So you see it, but you don't get the whole thing. So the Bible, you're going to see pictures here, pictures here. Ezekiel's got pictures. Daniel's got pictures. Job's got pictures. Zephaniah's got pictures. Jesus gave us some pictures. Paul's given it. And so you take all these different pictures and bites And if you begin to put them on the timeline, like we're showing you, you begin to see where they fit. And God's building this picture. That makes sense? So we have a prophetic word, more sure to which you do well, to pay attention. Everybody say, pay attention. Pay attention to the word as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Say, in my heart. When the star, when something's arising in your heart, that has to do with light. Verse 20, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, watch this. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, because people ask me sometimes, well, how do we know? Because didn't men write the Bible? Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So the Bible we have is prophetically inspired. It's, Paul said to Timothy like this, it's God-breathed. All Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable. It's God-breathed for instruction, reproof, training in righteousness that we're thoroughly equipped, all right? So here we see no prophecy, no word was ever made by an act of human will. Now, this is important because you got all the different uh, 1,000, how many different chapters in the Bible? All these different things and, and from thousands of years put together, and it's, and it's, it's amazing, it's the bestseller. The Bible's the best-selling book of all time. But it's a marvelous book. Everybody say a marvelous book. The Bible, the Word of God, which is spirit and life. It's not just letters on a page. But when you take it and you begin to implement it under your heart. I was telling somebody this week, I was talking about the Word and how it's like so many times we get born again. We start out with like a blank canvas. And, and God gives us a picture. You know, if I say shaggy dog, shaggy black dog, you didn't just hear words. You got a picture. And if I say he's got a red bandana around a black shaggy dog, red bandana, he's got white paws. Every stroke, every word, every phrase begins to create and paint more of a picture. And so God takes his word and he begins to paint just maybe in one area, maybe in righteousness or who you are in Christ. And as you begin to get more of the strokes of God's word, more of God's thoughts in that area... The picture gets bigger, and you want to get a Picasso of who you are in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So in this same area, learning about end times, we can develop the Picasso. And you go, whoo, man, we're about to get out of here. We are about to see the master face to face. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you, church. You, we're about to see Jesus. Hallelujah. So the, Mar- the, the Bible, it's, a, it's an amazing book. It has great design. Only God could have put the Bible together. Let me give you a few, one of my favorite examples. I mean, there's so many. But in Psalm 117, put this up on the In Psalm 117, Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. How many of you knew that? Shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 118 is the very center. Well, verse 8 which is the very center of the center chapter in the Bible, says it's better to put your trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. Now, let's, change, let's, let's work with this just a minute. There are 594 chapters before Psalm 118. You might want to keep that in mind. Now, watch this. 594 chapters in the Bible before you get to Psalm 118. There's 594 chapters after Psalm 118. So keep in mind, verse 8 8 is the very middle, so you've got 1,118. All right? Verse 8 being in the middle, which says it's better to put your trust in God than to put your trust in men. The book of Psalms alone was canonized, put together, and assembled by ancient Hebrews hundreds of years before the New Testament was ever even written. So how does that happen? Only God. It's an amazing book. You understand what I just said? 
they put the Psalms. The Psalms was part of the, you had the, you had the, the, the five books, Matt, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You had the, you had the, Psalm, you had the, can, the, the Pentateuch, what they call it. You had those first five books of the law is what they called it. And then you had, then you had uh, Psalms and Proverbs and some of the ancient books. And so those things are all there, but then you put the end in it and you put out and you're like, put your trust in God. Trust his word. His word never fails. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never fail. All right? So, so it's amazing when you begin to see it all put together. And, 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 and again, these different scriptures and pictures, and, and we have, we have uh, types and shadows of certain things that, that actually you put it all together, and they create a bigger picture. I'll give you an example of that. All right? So again, these pictures, you, you, you begin to put this chapter and this picture together with this, and, and it creates the overall concept. And so we're going to look at that. Now, in Colossians chapter 2, go over there because we haven't looked at this scripture. I've mentioned it, but we haven't talked about it. This is a very important New Testament passage right here in Colossians chapter 2 when we're talking about end times and understanding, again, the timeline. And I'll get to this timeline. We'll put it up there in just a minute. Verse 16 says, Therefore, no, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival, now that would be, we talked about the seven feasts of Israel. All right, there's three in the spring, four in the fall. Seven feasts of Israel, so he's talking about a festival or a new moon. Again, it's important to understand, Israel, the Jews operated, Israelite, they, they operate on a, on, on a lunar calendar. All right, they, they don't operate on, I mean, like their new year starts coming up here in September 18th, the new moon which is nicknamed the, the day that no man knows. Some people go, we just don't know the day or the hour. And the Bible says nobody knows the day or the hour when they're supposed to. Well, it was nicknamed the day that no man knows because you don't know when the, new, when, the new, when the new moon, when that full moon comes, that first time, they would send two people out to, to watch it. And as soon as they saw the new moon, the full moon's up, they would make notice, they would not, and then they were going to blow the shofar horn, and it's time to start the festival. Feast of Trumpets. Rosh Hashanah. Teshuvah which is also a call to repentance, 40 days. And then you got that 10 days later, you got Yom Kippur or what we know as Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. Every 50 years, with year of Jubilee, every 50 years, everybody's debts were canceled. Everybody got to go free if you're a slave. Israel just celebrated their 70th Jubilee just recently. And then it's interesting, right after that 70th year, our president declared Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And it's not by accident, folks. I was thinking a lot of fun stuff here, all right? Now, uh, he says, so he says, therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or everybody say a Sabbath day. Now, I'm going to pull this one out because this is what I want you to see. This helps us understand the timeline. The Sabbath day. Say it again, the Sabbath day. Or in Israel, they call it Shabbat. Now, in Israel, I was just there this last May, and they, 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 their rest day, their Sabbath day, their Shabbat is on Saturday. And we got to experience it because all the food that they had from the day before, basically, you got the leftovers. All of our group, we go down to eat breakfast, and, and nothing is hot. It's, it's all the cold stuff. I mean, you know what I mean? Not, not bad. Like, just like, they're not making fresh eggs. Nobody's working on Shabbat. I don't like Shabbat. <laughs> the reason they got so mad at Jesus is because he was doing stuff. He was healing people on Shabbat. And they said, you're not supposed to be doing that. And, he, and Jesus had to tell them, look, this day was made for you, not you for that day in any way. And, and so the command to rest is very important. And so we'll get into that in just a minute. So he says a Sabbath day. Now notice in verse 16 here, these things, the festivals, the new moon, the Sabbaths, these things are a shadow or a type of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. So in other words, he's telling us these things that we're talking about, actually Christ is going to be the fulfillment of these things. And you're going to see these pictures and these things develop, all right? So let's talk about the Sabbath just a minute. Let's talk about a Sabbath day because this helps us, especially in the millennium, because the millennial is a day of rest. The, the thousand-year rule and reign, the devil is bound up. Devils, demons, they're, they're bound up. They are not operating. But we're ruling and reigning. It's a time of rest on the earth. The, the whole earth gets to rest a little bit. I, I don't think there's going to be mosquitoes. In the, I just don't think there are going to be mosquitoes in the, in the millennium. I don't think there's going to be dust storms in the millennium. No. 
No, praise the Lord. Amen. We'll be delivered. But God established the Sabbath as the seventh day of the week. All right? Remember, we've talked about it. He created the earth in six days. We see this from Genesis 1. On the seventh day, what did he do? He just kicked back and said, I'm going to chill for a little while. He rested. And so that is a picture, all right? He rests all over the earth. Everybody, don't matter what country I go to, you can go anywhere in the world, and everybody observes, observes a seven-day work week. We measure time and periods of about 30 days. Why? Because that's about how long it takes for the moon to make its cycle around the earth. But if you think about the solar system and the planet, that just blows me away. Because you've got the moon coming around the earth and you've got the earth going around the sun. Well, we measure that. And so about 30 days it takes that, that cycle for the moon to come around. All right? Well, we measure time and periods of 365 days. And we call those years because it takes the earth that long to make a complete revolution around the sun. All right? Nothing happens in heaven on the seventh day. That's all earth stuff. All right? You got the picture? So the seven-day cycle was established by God back in Genesis. And according to the Bible, this seven-day cycle is a picture of things to come. It gives, it's the shadow. It's the type. All right? And so here's the picture. All right? Man had six days to work. And on the seventh day, he's supposed to rest. Now, listen, I'll just be honest with you. Rest is a good thing. If you're working hard and you're working six days, if you're one of those people, you're just working seven days a week, you're going to burn out. I'm not saying you have to. This is not a, Paul said, hey, Paul said you're redeemed from this in the New Testament. This is not a law. Old Testament, that's why they got upset with Jesus because they wanted him. They didn't want, you know, they got the man. You know, Jesus told that man, take up your pallet and go on the Sabbath. And he, they said, where are you going? They said, well, the, the Lord told, he told me to go to, he told me to get out of here. They said, you're not supposed to be carrying that. You know, they get mad, you know. But, of course, if their donkey got stuck in the mud or something, they had to pull their pig out, they're going to do that, you know. So Jesus said, you hypocrites, you know, anyway. So a lot of interesting things there. But, but so man, man has six days to work. The seventh day he was to rest. And really, the goal was to give that day exclusively to God and just give God some attention. Make sure you're focusing on the Lord. What do you do? Go to church. That's a good, hey, that's what they do. You go to church on Sunday or Saturday or whatever, whatever day, whatever day you're going to go. But at least you're giving time to God. You're going to focus on God. You're going to worship God. You're going to give him some focus and some praise and some attention, all right? Now, again, in the New Testament, we're not required to keep the Sabbath the way the Jews did. It's all a picture of things to come. So now, with that being said, go to 2 Peter. Let's talk about this because I'm going to give you this timeline. Now, remember what 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Let's look at a few of these verses. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, well, we're there. In the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? Pastor, why are you preaching on this? Well, because there are going to be people that say, well, I, they've been talking about Jesus coming. and you, it, well, well, you know what? You don't stop talking about the fact that he's coming. Because he hasn't come doesn't mean you stop talking about it. He's coming. And, the more, and, and I could just say it like that. It's later than it's ever been before. All right? So, skip down to verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day... Is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Now, uh, let's put the timeline up there, uh, Michelle. Here we go. So, the Lord told me to draw a timeline to begin to put these different things into place. And, uh, you know, I I got my little pen here so I can point where I want to. Let's see. Oh, look at that. Uh I'm getting smarter here so I can point where I want to go. Anyway, so, from Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus was 2,000 years. And so now we've got Jesus and all this we've talked about. How do we know in all this? And, and we've looked at these things and what God showed Daniel. And to get right to this point right here, from Jesus to right around here where the rapture is, and then this 1,000 years here. So we've got, notice we've got two, four, six, what, seven. What's the seven? It's the time of rest. All right? So we've been really focused in the last several weeks about what takes place right here, the rapture, and then you've got the... Uh, the Ezekiel 38 war and the timeline. So you got seven. Isn't it interesting? The, the tribulation is seven years. And right in the middle of that, three and a half years, that's when the Antichrist really comes in and turns on the heat. He's going to make a, a, a peace treaty. And again, Trump was just involved. It's been a big deal. 
the UAE, United Arab Emirates, signed the peace deal with Israel, and now they're at this big, big, that's big stuff. So there's a little bit of a false peace coming, and there's more that are going to be added to it, but then the Antichrist is going to come in and really sign this thing right after the church is out of here. He's going to come in, and we're already out. The rap church is raptured, and he's going to, so all that's taking place right in here in this little seven-year period. So again, you start putting on this, and you realize, so really the big question is, is we're, okay, understanding, and we've talked about it right here, the church age lasts 2,000 years. God, God's really given man dominion on the earth for 6,000 years. And how many know, we're, if you just look at, I mean, we're in 2000, what, 20 here? So Jesus died in 33 AD. So if you talk about some things that we've already looked at, some different things, but, but again, uh, according to the word, we're about 6,000 years into man's dominion on the earth, all right? So the Lord basically is about to reclaim what belongs to him. Now, according to Genesis 126, God gave man dominion. Or, now, he says the earth, he's given to the sons of men, but it belo- God has it to give. It belongs to him. Psalm 24 actually says, verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. So basically, you could say it like this, man has a lease on the earth. God's given man dominion on the earth. Multiply, replenish it, work it, have dominion over it. All right, but we know man fell, so Satan took control. Satan has authority. He's called the God of this world. If we get there, we'll talk about that. The God of this age. This is the consummation of the ages. If he's the God of this age, that means his time's about to be up. All right, so what we begin to understand is God is going to, God is giving us pictures to help us realize where we are in God's timetable. Let me say it like this. God doesn't fly by the seat of his pants. How many of y'all understand that? God doesn't, if something happens in your life, God goes, oop, we didn't even know that was coming. When you're trying, what's God going to do? And then God doesn't go, oops, you know, we didn't plan for that. What are we going to do now? God never goes, "Uh uh-oh. He doesn't do that. He doesn't, he's already prepared the marriage supper of the lamb ahead of time. He saw us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He's already got, he's got it. Now he knows exactly when these times are. And I'm fixing to show you something because again, even in earth, there's a season for everything. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But now watch this. Let me show you. Let me, I want to give you some more about, you can leave that timeline or, or, or up there if we don't have a scripture up there just so people can see it. But Revelation, we know from Revelation that six is the number of man. So what are we talking about? Again, we're, if we're talking about the Sabbath and a seventh period, uh, uh, the seventh day, and God says one day is a thousand years. Thousand. So again, you see the picture of a day, a day, a day, all the way down to the end of 6,000, and then you got the seven. So let me show you. Man's end, man, man's days end at six. All right, let me give you this one. How many, when did, when did the flood come in Noah's life? 600. 600 years when the flood came. So again, you see a picture. Everybody say pictures. Pictures are like signs. They tell us what's coming. They reveal. So Noah's day, he was 600 when the flood came. All right? Now, Revelation tells us the Antichrist number is what? 666. All right? Six is always associated with man coming short before God. Did you know that when Pharaoh went after the children of Israel, he went after Israel, it specifically says, with 600 chariots. Everybody say 600 chariots. What happened? Uh, They came to an end. All right? When Nebuchadnezzar, how many remember Nebuchadnezzar? If you read the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he saw this big statue. Well, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar built, that image of gold, uh, and he commanded the people to come worship that image, it was 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and was worshipped when 6 musical instruments were played. Now, I'll give you something else just while I'm thinking about it. I didn't have this in my notes. 120 is a very important number. Remember, in Genesis, it said, man's day shall be 120. Interesting verse. But there was 120 in the upper room. Uh, If you multiply 50 times 120, you get 6,000. Very interesting. 50 is a big number. 50 nails and different, there's a lot of 50s in the temple and, and all this and, and 120. And so the numbers are crazy. We think about the Bible and all there is, we're going to get blown. When, I mean, I believe we're going to have a class when we get to heaven and God will say, well, this is what this means, this is what this means, this is what number. And we're going to be going, what? <laughs> what? You mean that's right there? That's what that was? So now check this one out. There were six steps to Solomon's temple. Going up, six steps to Solomon's temple. 
when Goliath, anybody remember Goliath? He was a big old ugly Philistine, uncircumcised Philistine. When Goliath came out to fight Israel, his height was six cubits in span. His spear had weighed his spearhead weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and he had six pieces of armor. These are all pictures of the days of man. Man's, man's days on the earth, six thousand years. God's taken over. He said he's gonna be a time of rest. So six again is the number of the Antichrist. We know six 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 is his number. Did you know if you Google it, if you look up the European Union, and by the way, you know the UN is, called a, is, is basically a peacekeeping organization, and the whole purpose for the UN was to try to create peace. And I'm convinced the Antichrist may have a big uh, involvement with that, but if you go online and Google it, there's actually a seat, and there, these seats are numbered, and there's actually a number uh, on, 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 this, on the seat, and it says 666, and nobody sits there. Why don't you go look it up? Anyway, some crazy stuff. But here's this timeline that we have, and so we see these pictures. The Sabbath is specifically what we're talking about that's showing, and so you see the timeline here. Now, let's keep going here in verse 10. Look at verse 10. This is 1 Peter, because I've got I to keep trucking here and end this up. Verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which that now, now this is interesting. Peter is going kind to of just smash it all up. He, he, you know, sometimes we sing songs, we call them smash songs. It's kind of like three or four songs, and they all smash together. Well, Peter's going to take kind of everything, really what takes place over a thousand-year period, and just kind of smash it up. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he had quite the revelation that Paul had. But he says, but the day of the Lord will come. That would be what? The second coming of Jesus, not the rapture. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. See, the world's going to be in total darkness. There's delu- a, a delusion during the tribulation period. And you know, three different times... Three different times beginning in Revelation, I think six, no, no, it's 13, beginning toward the mid-tribulation, all of that, three different times it says men do, will not repent. God's doing this, and men will not repent. It's just, it just gets darker and darker and darker, and repentance is always, you know, repentance is the key to freedom. Did y'all know that? That's always the key to freedom. God is merciful, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. The key to freedom and to Come out of whatever darkness. It's repent. What does that mean? Change the way you've been thinking. Anyway, so he says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Well, that's, that's what the Bible says that when after the millennial period and the judgment time, God's going to create a new heavens and a new earth and the earth is going to get burned up. You say, how's he going to do that? I have no idea. Is he moving us all to Mars? Or I don't know how <laughs> he does it. But he says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. All right? And so this, this, this covers what Peter says right here. That covers about a thousand-year period when Jesus comes back and all that begins to take place. So I want you to see that. So again, if you can understand the other pieces, and how, then you understand, okay, well, Peter's just talking about all of this really from one end to the other. And he kind of just sandwiched it together. But you have all these other pieces. And when you understand eschatology, again, it's like I said, it's like the Tour de France. Y'all know what the Tour de France is? You know where people are riding those bikes, and one day they're going X amount of miles, and then they stop, and then they're going again the next day. And so it's a, they call it the Tour de France because they're going all, they're riding all over the place. And, and it's different sequences. And so it's like that. There's going to be a series of... Of sequences, number one, we're going to get raptured out of here. Then you got the Ezekiel 38 war. Then the tribulation thing. And you got seals and trumpets and bowls of wrath and all kinds. And the Antichrist. And, and, and we're just going to be in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going, whoo, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Getting ready to rule and reign. Probably getting some instructions. Hallelujah. But the purpose here and what we're talking about is just to recognize and understand that we're living in the last days. We're in the last days, and you begin to see all this thing. And, and remember, if you go, remember, look at Genesis. Enoch was what? The seventh generation from Adam, and he saw Revelation 19. He saw the saints coming with Jesus. You go read it, Revelation 19. He, he prophesied. He prophesied, and he was the father uh, of Methuselah, and Methuselah lived 969 years. Methuselah means when he's dead, it shall come. And so Noah knew when Methuselah died, it's time for the flood. And he was spared, and so we've talked about that and pictured that. Let me just close with a few verses right here. Isaiah 46, verse 9 through 10 says, God declares the end from the beginning. So what does that mean? 
He knows how to put it in the sequence. He knows how to tell us. He knows how to give us the pictures, and he's done it in his word. All right? He, he declares the end from the beginning. Revelation 1.8, Jesus said, I am the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end. Everybody say the end. Now, let me close with just a few more verses. The season and the return of the Lord is upon us. So let me give you these verses right here. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says to everything, say to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. That's why I said God doesn't fly by the seat of his pants. There's a purpose for everything under heaven, including the Antichrist. God already knows. He knows you. He knows your plan. He knows everything about you. Now watch this. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21 this is talking about God. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He does that. Now, the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7, you see that reference, Daniel 7, 25. It says when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to try to change the times and the seasons. He's going to try to make, he thinks that he's going to be like Christ. He wants to be like Jesus. Can you think about it? He wants to be like Jesus. All right? And so he's going to try to change those times, but he's not going to be able to do it. So understanding this helps us to function. In Daniel, now watch this. Daniel chapter 2, when, when Daniel, a, a, a great key to understand a lot of end time stuff is, is the book of Daniel. If you understand the first part, when he's revealing Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he's talking about four empires. When he gets over into chapter 7, he's talking about the same four empires, but he's talking about, the, he's talking about different animals, the bear. The time, anyway, so he's going through, and so each one is ending, each, the final empire is talking about the Antichrist and what the Antichrist is going to do. So he says here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, however, he's revealing Nebuchadnezzar, he says, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. Everybody say the latter days. So we've got things, so we, how, we're in the latter days. We're in the last of the last days. And then if you go over to Job chapter 19, verse 25, it says, For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Well, Jesus started the latter day. Verse NIV says, and at the end, he will stand on the earth. Well, well at the end, too, when he comes, when we come back with him, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to speak a word and just he's going to toast some people. Anyway, so Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, Seal up the book until the end of time. What are we talking about? Well, there's an end to this age. There's an end to the age. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 24, verse 3. He says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? We're talking about in that timeline, when you see that end of that 6,000, the millennial period is a whole new age. So we're ending up, the end of the 6,000, we're ending up this age. That's why we're calling it the consummation of the ages. And so when Paul's writing to the Corinthians, look, get this. Don't, don't, don't go to sleep on me on this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to something right here. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now watch this, verse 11. Now these things, he's talking about the Israelites. He said, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Well, Paul was talking to them back then about the end of... Uh, these things for, or for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We have to take note. This, that was 2,000 years ago. We're right here at the end. All right? So, just a few more. Watch this now. <laughs> trying to find a place to stop. Second, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Now, watch this. Ephesians 2, verse 5 says, By grace have you been saved, raised us up, and he's raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that what? In the ages to come. That ought to make you shout. He might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We're going to be around for the ages to come, but this one's about to close down. This is about, the curtain is about to come down on this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. Now watch. I'm getting all this to get to this point right here. Watch this. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world, that is the Greek word age, the God of this age has what? Blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So who's causing the darkness right now? Satan, he's the God of this what? Age. 
this world, I mean, he's, he's got a time period. And it's about, he's, his time period's about to be up. But he's a deceiver, and he blinds people. So in your prayers for your family, and I'm closing, in your prayers for your family, what do you do? Lord, open their eyes. Pray for light. Let's pray for light. That's what Paul prayed in Ephesians, that the eyes of our understanding be it enlightened. Well, no. So bind the devil. Bind the darkness. And say, Lord, open their eyes. Send laborers across their path. He's the Lord of the harvest. And that's what Jesus said to do. Hey, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. Let's be laborers ourselves. Lord, make me a laborer. Send me across. How do we pray in these last days? Lord, send me across somebody's path. And it might be that you're going to lead them to the Lord. It might just be you're there to sow some seed and to, and to, and to encourage them. Lord, make me a laborer. Send laborers across. You got Uncle Bob that lives up in Washington in Portland, bless his darling heart. Uh, whoever, anyway, I'm just saying, pray, Lord, send laborers across Uncle Bob's path. You can get specific. Send laborers. Open their eyes. Lord, we, want, we need light. Remember, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that veil. And in Christ, in that chapter, if you read chapter, that chapter there, for he's talking about the veil being removed from Moses' face, and, and that veil is... When, the veil, when, when people receive Jesus, that veil is, is gone, and they see. Remember, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light. Jesus is the light of the world. So if we could just get them to just get a little bit of a glimpse of Jesus, he's the answer. He's the answer. Now, let me close with this. I said I was going to close, but let me give you this. Paul, because we're on this, and you need to see this. Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 6 and 8, he refers to the rulers of this age. So not just that the enemy is the God of this world, but, but he, it's like a, a whole army. And we have authority over that army. And we do business in prayer. I'm saying all this because we're going we're gonna to have 40 days of prayer starting the end of the month, all the way up to right before election day. We're going to hammer it. We're going to hammer it. We're going to see some harvest. We're going to pray for our, our nation, church, our city. Hallelujah. But he talked about the rulers of this age. And it's about to be up. Hallelujah. Think about this. Jesus said in, verse, in Luke 20, 34, Jesus said to them, the sons of this age, listen, he was talking about, what, what are we going to do when we get in heaven? Do we marry people? Well, do I, am I going to get married? Am I going to know my wife? I want to know my husband. And, and, well, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are, con who are considered worthy... To attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. <laughs> That's why Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world, and the end shall come. We're preaching the good. What's the good news? In Jesus, you get to experience the resurrection. In Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. So, praise the Lord. I don't know if I'm helping anybody or not, but it's keeping me stirred up. Did you learn something this morning? Well, I got lots more. Can you handle a little bit more? Is it, I mean, I know sometimes it's a little more teachy, you know, and, but, but it's to help you. I'm a little more of a teacher, so if we can, we can put some things and help draw the pictures for you. So, let's lift our hands and let's just thank the Lord right now for His mercy. Uh, amen. Everybody say, His mercy endures forever. Great is his faithfulness. Go ahead and stand up. Come on, let's just lift our hands and, and let's just thank him right now. Lord, we just look to you right now. You're so merciful and you're so kind and, and you are so good. Hallelujah. And so Lord, we thank you for light in our city, light in our nation. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In these last days, it might be getting darker in the world and it will get darker in the world. But Lord, you said that we will shine. You said let our, we are to let our light shine. Hallelujah. Like a city on a hill. Thank you for a church that understands this, Lord, that we are like a city on a hill, and we're letting our light shine, and we're, and we're doing good works, and those works are glorifying you. And so, Father, we just thank you, Lord. If there are people right here in this auditorium that have never made Jesus the Lord of their life, or maybe just haven't been living right, or maybe trying to just struggling to overcome certain things, listen, don't forget, repentance is the doorway into freedom. And all you got to do is just simply say, Jesus, would you forgive me? I'm willing to turn. I'm tired of doing things on my own. I'm not going to do it my own way. I just need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. Come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. 
Hallelujah. I call you Lord. Everybody just say that out loud. Say, I call you Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. And I'm not ashamed to call you Lord. Come on, say, thank you for the blood that you shed for me. You have forgiven me and cleansed me of all my sin. In you, Jesus, I have no past. I have a future. And I thank you for it. Oh, come on, just bless the Lord a minute. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Come on, just thank him a minute. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for having a wonderful plan for us. Thank you for the word that sets us free. Hallelujah. How many of you love the Lord this morning? Do you love him? I said, do you love him? You're not ashamed of him, are you? I mean, if somebody put a gun to your head and say, you need not Jesus right now, are you going to get to meet him? What would you do? I'd say, you can't kill a dead man. This is just a house right here. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go see Jesus right now. <laughs> Amen. Well, I got to stop. Well, did you learn something this morning? Well, Miss Denise has just a few quick announcements. I didn't mean to go past the, I don't know, people can start getting hungry and stuff, but I know the mind can only handle what the seat can endure, but, but you, I, I'm building those muscles back there for you, so... Anyway, love you guys. Say, that's okay, Pastor. <laughs> We're glad, aren't we? We're thankful for a pastor that cares enough to make sure that we get it, that we understand, and that we're ready. Amen? Well, I do want to remind you, grab a bulletin if you didn't get one as you go out. Sign up at one of our next deck tables if you'd like to be a part of that partnership class. And then also mark your calendars, teenagers, the 11th and the 12th for our lake trip. You guys have a blessed week. We'll see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right back here for another great service. You are dismissed.